Thank you so much for joining us today, either on the app or online for uh, the messages and resources that we offer here. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, um, I would ask and even encourage you to think about joining with us, not only through prayer, but also financially. We're in the season of expanding our student ministry building for more ministry opportunities within our area. And we're getting really close to being able to do it, but we still have a little ways to go. If you would, you could see on your app or also online, you can go to giving and you can also make it reoccurring uh, for your convenience. Hope you have a wonderful day and enjoy the message. Now, if you would, turn with me in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Um, I warned y'all a few weeks ago and purposely didn't even put anything on Facebook yesterday about what this message today was going to be about, where we're going to be talking about sex. So if you have your child in here, it is not too late for them to go to um, Kids Church uh, next door right there um, with the thumping music that you hear. We'd love for them to be over there. And, uh, but otherwise, we're going to have a really great conversation um, about the beauty, the wonder, the exhilaration, the excitement about having sex and the covenant of marriage and how wonderful it is, why we should wait, why we shouldn't have it outside of marriage, but also why it is such a wonderful thing and how the Bible does not have a low view of sex, but has such a high view of it. But before we get there, let's do our New City Catechism together. We're on week 10, and the question is this. We'll answer together. You'll see it on the screen. What does God require in the fourth and fifth commandments? Fourth, that on the Sabbath day, we spend time in public and private worship of God, rest from routine employment, serve the Lord and others, and so anticipate the eternal Sabbath. Fifth, that we love and honor our father and our mother, submitting to their godly discipline and direction. Sadly, the church doesn't talk about sex very often, and it's almost one of those things that you kind of blush a little bit, and I'm going to probably make some of you blush today. Um, if you were wondering how you got into this world, it was not by a stork who carried you from Looney Tunes. I mean, this was your mom and your dad uh, getting very, very intimate together, okay? And uh, so we're going to talk about that, and sadly, because the church hasn't talked about that, it also means that a lot of the parents have not talked about it. Um, it, at best, maybe you had an awkward conversation about the birds and bees, but honestly, most of us never had that conversation in the first place because the parents did not want to have that awkward conversation. Well, I'll go ahead and tell you what's going to happen. Your children, if not told, if not expressed and explained why, rather than, you should not do it, God said so. I get that. I understand that. But from a young mind, that's just another reason to rebel in one sense or another. Everybody else is doing it. Why not we? You know, why should I be any different? Why should I delay pleasure? Why should I delay gratification? And the answer we're going to talk about today is that sex is this powerful weapon that God has created for a man and a woman in covenant relationship to grow together, to bind and knit their souls together. And here's the deal. If you are utilizing it outside of marriage, it will use that same powerful effect to destroy the relationships that you are in or will be in. And before too long, you can only leave yourself behind with so many people before you're unable to give yourself to the one in which you say, that's mine. She's mine. He's mine. And so what I'm saying is the Bible has a wonderful view of sex, as we're going to talk about today, does not have a low view of sex. The problem in this world today is that we sell uh, sex so cheap. I'm not talking about that you pay for sex. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying that basically, why do we wonder, for men in particular, but women as well, why do we wonder that they wait so long? On average now, a man will be 27 years old before he's married. Why do we wait so long? Why do you think that, well, if you're getting every single benefit, supposedly, of a marriage without having to have the commitment of marriage, the covenant faithfulness, the vow of never to leave and never to forsake and always to love, if you're giving that up, and all the other supposed benefits with it, which aren't going to allow you to be close anyway, because here's the deal. There is no commitment apart from marriage that you really have with that person. I don't care if they bought you a ring or not. They're still not committed. They're still, it's not the same. And you say, well, I don't need a piece of paper. Go a few weeks back, listen to the message. Yes, you do. It's not the paper that means something. It's the covenant before God Almighty that makes the difference. Where you say, for better, for worse, sickness and health, till death do us part. I want to say this real clear as Christians. Not that maybe you heard this before and maybe you didn't go through premarital counseling. But here's the deal. As Christians, 
we do not, we do not, we, we try not, we seek in every form and fashion not to get divorced. Which means that man, We've got to fight, and we've got to do it God's way, because the way of the world does not work. All you've got to do is, is see the destruction that's left behind when people do it their way and don't do it God's way. God has a wonderful plan. I want you to notice one thing, not in Scripture yet, but remember what God said to Adam. He said, you can have every single tree in this garden. I mean... God's over here saying, I am not a limiter of pleasure. I am the giver of all pleasure and all good gifts. But when I tell you not to touch something, there's a reason why I tell you not to touch it. You know, even if it doesn't seem right to you now, have you ever wondered as a small child when your parents told you not to do something, you thought you were smarter than them and you decided to do it and it bit you in the tail end more than one time and maybe you're still living with those consequences? Maybe they knew a little bit more than you and I'd like to say this, God infinitely knows more than we do. So when your emotions and your hormones tell you one thing, that is why we find ourselves in the Word of God to direct us and to guide us. See, marriage vows are not for when you feel like it. Marriage vows are for when you don't feel like it. Commandments of God are not for when you feel like it. It's when you don't feel like it that they guide our lives. That's why you soak the Word of God in your heart because there's going to be a million times, almost every day, and I'm not just talking about sex, just period. That you're going to be tempted in one form or another, but it's the Word of God, not your feelings, not your emotions. You know as well as I do, you can't trust your feelings or your emotions, and many times we deceive ourselves. That's why we must have the Word of God and be surrounded by godly community so that we can succeed as followers of Jesus in this life. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. It says, All things are lawful to me, or for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know then that, you're mem that you are members of Christ? Shall I then take members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never! Or do you not know that he who joins himself to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two shall become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of the body, but sexual immorality, uh, the sexually immoral person, sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Now concerning the matter about which you wrote, is it good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman? But because of temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not, hear this out, church, do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. That is the word of the Lord this morning. I don't know if you noticed in there, in three different places in which I was reading, did you see the quotations that were in there? On verse 12 it says, All things are lawful for me. And this is another way of saying this was probably a slogan of the Corinthian church. Like this was something they were saying. And remember what Paul says, Galatians 5.1, we said it earlier. For freedom Christ has set us free, but not to enslave ourselves to sin again. Correct? We've been set free to live to God, to His glory. It says that the body is for God and the Lord for the body. Like, we're not to live for our own pleasure and our own self-seeking. There will be plenty of it when we live for God, but the whole point, the whole purpose is that we live for Him. What does he say in verse 19? He says, you are not your own. You were bought with the price. And what was the price? Did we forget that his hands were stretched, his legs were crossed, beaten and bruised and ripped apart with nails through his hand and through his feet, with a spear through his side? You were bought, my friends. You were bought with a price. Don't forget it, that we are God's. Therefore, let's glorify God in our body. And so what Paul's getting at, he says, you're taking this thing that I say, 
and you're twisting it and perverting it as though it's okay for you to go and have sex with anyone that you basically want. They're basically taking a Christian freedom and saying, well, that means that, hey, I can, I can kind of go have sex with who I want because that's kind of how I feel and the bodies aren't really useful. And Paul's over here saying, do you not know that God raised Jesus from the grave? And do you not know that our mortal bodies will be raised? And do you not know that we're in Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus is in us? And therefore, when we connect ourselves with someone else more... Hear this out, church. More than something physical is happening when you have sex with someone else. There is something greater taking place. And sex was always intended to be the giving of one's whole self. Emotionally, physically, uh, uh, financially, uh, legally, spiritually. Every aspect. It's a wholeness because it says in Genesis what? 225, they were naked and unashamed. There was complete transparency because the two had become one flesh. And so what is Paul getting at? He's saying, how could we ever, being in Christ, how could we ever have sex with a prostitute? And some of you are like, well, I've never had sex with a prostitute. Here's the only difference between having sex with people outside of marriage. You're not paying them for it. Is that clicking? Sex outside of marriage, you're not paying them, but is it not the same thing? And you might not be paying them directly with money, but are you not paying them with your company? Are you not paying them with dates? Are you not paying them with jewelry? Are you not? And you're like, well, I'm just trying to express my love. Then love them in the covenant of marriage. I don't want to wait that long. Are we still the small boys who can't wait and have to be gratified at every single moment where we can't delay it? The answer is, of course not. I'm not even here today to talk about all the sexually transmitted diseases. You know the stats, and if you don't know them, just look them up. They're everywhere. I'm not even here for that. I'm here to talk about the ripping of one's soul in the process that you can only give yourself so many times away until finally you become numb to the whole process. And therefore, we become more like animals, less like humans. That is why we ought to wait. That's why we ought to maintain what God has called us to do. There's four views or worldviews on sex. And this is what you can write down if you have your, your worship God with you. Number one is, and this is how the world views sex, right? Sex is like any other good and natural appetite, right? It's just like any other good and natural appetite. It's just like eating food. I mean, how could one deprive oneself of food? Could you imagine not eating food for a year or for two years or three years? Well, of course not. You would die. But is sex the same thing as food? The answer, absolutely not. But I would say this when we talk about food, if maybe you thought of that, being like, well, that's pretty clever. How about this? How many of us know that food is meant for what? Enjoyment, yes. But in particular, it's meant to fuel our bodies and our bodies for what? The Lord's service, right? That is what our bodies are meant for. And food is in particular meant to fuel us. But yet we know every single one of us struggle in some form, in some fashion, some more than others with eating too much of that food. I got invited last night to eat some crawfish, and I want to say this to you. It's not very easy to go for only three pounds. This man wants to go for five, six, and so much sodium's in your body, you feel like you're going to die. You know, I mean, you have to drink a little extra water to get it all out. But for many of us, we what? We take food from a good thing to a what? A thing that destroys us, ends up destroying our bodies to being gluttons. Right? Nobody wants to use that word anymore, but nonetheless. So it's like overeating... It's a distortion. And I want to give you this example in particular, which C.S. Lewis did. Just imagine this. He said, can you get a large audience together, or you can get a large audience together for a striptease act? That is to watch a girl undress on the stage. Now suppose you came to a country where you could fill a theater by simply bringing a covered plate onto the stage and then slowly lifting the cover so as to let everyone see just before the lights went out that it contained a mutton chop or a bit of bacon. Would you not think that in that country something had gone wrong with the appetite for food? And would not anyone who had grown up in a different world think that there was something equally queer about the state of the sex instinct among us? One critic said that if he found a country in which there was such a striptease act with food were popular, he would conclude that the country, the people who lived there in that country, were starving. Now, you think about this for a moment. How many of you would find it strange if I showed up on stage this morning with a nice platter right here and we played some erotic music and I slowly but surely, with dim lights flashing everywhere, slowly but surely just begin to lift this up and everybody just start going, 
Wow. And then you started pulling, this is the crazy part, the hard-earned money that you work for every week, you just start pulling that out of your pocket and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You start throwing that. How many of y'all would think that was awfully strange, that there had been a perversion of our appetites? What is different about sex, knowing that well over half of the world has the same issue when it comes to sexual relations? Sex is not just a physical thing, it affects our brains. Our brains have been affected. It is enlarged and engrossed. You see, the biggest problem with us is no one's starving. In particular, not in America. Statistically, 90% of people before they're married will have had sex outside of marriage before they get married. Nine out of ten people will have had sex before they have gotten married at this point in time. Now, here's the deal. We've got to begin to say, are we going to look like the world which does not work? Or are we going to do it like Jesus has called us to do it? You know, some people are saying, well, listen, I, I know what it's right to do, but I just, I just don't, I just, it's just hard. And I want to say this to you. God will not bless what he says is disobedience. God will not bless sin in your life. God will not do it because it is contrary to him. And I'll go ahead and say this to you. Yes, it is easier for me to say these things on the other side now being married, okay? I get this. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying this, but I am trying to put out some things, in particular for those of you who are still single, that listen, what your past is, if you humbly repent earnestly with a contrite heart before God, yes, you will be forgiven, but don't let this be your future any longer, no matter what you used to be or who you used to say you were. All that matters is how God sees you. So the question is, are we starving for sex? The answer is absolutely not. Contraceptives and uh, birth control that every single high school girl gets on, and you know why they get on it? Because they want to control their period, correct? No, not at all. All you have to do is look at girls in 8th grade, 7th, 8th grade, look at the statistics for them. Ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. By the time 12th grade hits, almost 50% of all girls have had some type of sexual activity. And this is the girls, right? This ain't counting the nutty guys, okay? All you have to do is look at the statistics. The problem is not lack of. The problem is we have completely perverted the desire, which is good, that God has given us and used it outside of its context. Number two is sex is degrading and dirty. Sex is degrading and dirty. Many people outside of the church who know nothing about the church, who've never read the Bible, think that this is what the church thinks. Like, you shouldn't be having sex. And I'll go ahead and tell you, you read the Bible, the Bible will make you blush. Read through the Song of Solomon, and you will go through there and understand. He ain't talking about apples, and he ain't talking about navels, and he ain't talking about palm trees, and he ain't talking about gazelles and does. He's talking about something else, all right? Y'all ain't read the Song of Solomon, whatever. Y'all should read it later today. That's a good prelude to you reading the Bible today. All right, he's not talking. He's metaphorically talking about his encounter, and she's also talking back to him. And I tell you what, if you are a prude, the Bible will completely freak you out. It will. If, if you have this negative view of sex, and some of y'all been brought up in a church which never would talk about it and had a negative point of view on sex. Listen, the problem with some people is they have a dualistic, almost a Greek philosophy about the body. The body being one part, the soul being another part, the body being a lower part, the soul being a greater part. And I want to say this to you. God created everything. And what did he say? Genesis 131. And he said, and everything was very good. He didn't find Adam out back attacking Eve and saying, what are you doing, Eve? I mean, what's happening here? He didn't say that. He was like, go get him, boy. You know what I'm saying? Like, he wasn't saying this. God created the male told you you should put your kids up. God created them male and God created them female. God created us sexual beings and he said to do it in the context. He didn't say not to do it. He said where to do it. And then he didn't just say this. He said like maybe every now and then when you feel like you know God said you should do it often. You should enjoy it. It should be exhilarating. It should be fun. You should chase her around the house. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you should have bruises and scrapes because you fell in the process. Like it, this, is, this is where I'm saying, like, some of y'all are like, I don't know where he's going with this. But, like, some of y'all have the wrong view. All you have to do, again, look at Proverbs 5. Look at all of Song of Solomon. Look at 1 Corinthians 7. Check out the Bible. Uh, it's just, it's there. It's all over the place. Timothy Keller, the Bible is very uncomfortable book for the prudish. It's, it's an uncomfortable book because God created it. Therefore, God doesn't blush. And here's something too. Y'all ready for this, married people? It's you and your spouse. 
and God every time you have sex. God sees everything and God is everywhere, omnipresent at all times. God is there with you and when we have sex and delight in one another and praise him for the gift and the pleasure and the joy and the exhilaration of it, God's over here saying, yep, that's good. When in the context of marriage. Some of y'all are just like, you don't have to amen it to shout or what. You know what I'm saying? Like, some of us, we, we have a wrong view of it. And here's probably, here, I'll go ahead and do this. Here, probably part of your wrong view is partially because of shame of previous activity outside of the covenant of marriage, and therefore you're having trouble learning how to navigate the waters of the purity of marriage. Does that make any sense? Because you took something outside of the area that it was supposed to be, and now, by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the purification that the gospel brings, your mind is having to be renewed in that whole process because you took it out of its context. And so now being brought into its context, you're finding that things are different. Sex outside of marriage always includes risk, and it always includes this heightened awareness that you know something is not right. Sex in marriage does not include risk short of your children walking in on you, okay? <laughs> Do we have no parents with kids? Amen. Do you wonder why statistically it says that people have sex 2.4 times in the week? Well, let Johnny roll in, and that's your point four, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, y'all, y'all act like, y'all, I'm worried about some of y'all. There ain't enough physical activity going on here. Oh, man, I got so much to say today. Better keep rolling. Number three is sex is for self-fulfillment and self-realization. Right? That's what the world, in particular, in the last hundred years, that's really what we go towards. A lot of people, it's like, listen, it's all about, I just, I just want to be with that person. I really don't want to call that person because you have no right to want something from that person because you're not legally binded with that person. Um, you see what I'm saying? Like, they don't owe you anything. They don't owe you a call back the next morning. They don't owe you anything else as far as that goes. And when you see that person in public, you know as well as I do. Literally, it's awkward from that point forward with them. It just is because part of you has been left, okay? Like, you have to realize sex is bigger than just the body. And number four, and this is a biblical view of sex, sex is a wonderful gift from God to be enjoyed exclusively by male and female in the covenant of marriage. It's a wonderful gift. So why is sex outside of marriage sin? Why, why is that wrong? Why does God look down upon that? Why does God say in Hebrews that he will judge all fornicators? Why does he say things of that nature? Because sex in and of itself is meant to consummate the marriage. Like, sex is meant to literally intertwine your souls together. Sex is meant that the whole person, not just body, but spirit, soul, like you are literally engaging that person, never been closer to that person a day in your life. The closest thing there is to sex in marriage, and I don't mean this to freak you out a little bit, but it's almost a child coming into the world where two flesh are on each other and you don't know where one ends and the other begins. That's literally what is occurring here. And it's a beautiful thing from God. So one flesh in the Bible, you have to realize what that in particular understands. It means that you've gotten one entity and another entity coming together and it's making a third entity. Like something has changed here. It's not like when you make uh, cookies, for instance. You, you do the dough, right? You, you mix it all up, put the eggs, put the uh, flour and all that kind of stuff. And then you mix in there the uh, chocolate chips, right? You can still mix the chocolate chips in there, but if I wanted to, I could just easily kind of pull those things out. Well, that's not at all what it's like. It's more like hydrogen and oxygen being mixed together, creating H2O, water, right? It's more like that. You don't just separate it. And what sex outside of marriage is in particular, it's just the physical. It's just the physical. Why is it so hard for people who are, having, who are dating and having sex to break up? Why? Because you are doing a covenant act outside of the covenant of commitment in Christ within marriage. And so you want to know why it's so hard? It's because part of you is with them, if you will. Your, your soul, your heart, I mean, part of you, why do you call it cheating? You don't own them. Why do you call it cheating? But immediately upon having sex with someone, if they were to have sex with someone else, you would call it, if you're a normal person, obviously you would call that cheating, correct? So literally, this is another way of saying, why do people get crushed when they break up, if they're having sex. Well, it's not just that they put too much emphasis in another person, which they could never do. You're always going to be let down by a person. You're always going to be let down by a thing or by a pleasure. Your pleasure, your person, 
should be, must be Christ Jesus. Sex in and of itself, as much pleasure as it bring, only brings a dim look into glory, into knowing Christ Jesus. Why does that crush you? Because you've allowed more than you realize to be a part of that person. There's a young lady right now that I know who for every single practical, logical purpose should absolutely break up with this person because he is destructive, he is wrong, he will destroy her future, but she is having amply hard time because she feels responsible for him because they have been outside of the covenant of marriage and acting a covenant binding act. And so it's changed the way in which they view that relationship. So there's something more than just physically interacting with someone when having sex. You can't leave too much of you behind, is what I'm really getting at, and expect to be okay. And if someone were to say to me, well, listen, I have no issue, I have no conflict, I don't really believe your Bible stuff, I don't really care about it, and, and I don't, I don't, it doesn't bother me to have sex with multiple partners and, and whatever, I just, it really doesn't bother me. That means your conscience is seared, That means you've numbed yourself. And here's the thing. The very power that has the ability to bind you to your spouse in a way unlike anything else, if abused and if misused, will also have the very power to destroy you. And then sooner or later, you will not, when you do find that person, you will find it very difficult to be close, to be transparent, to love them because you have become so numb by using it outside. Think about pornography, for instance. Someone doesn't get addicted to pornography the first time they look. Pornography works in such a way that you see a little and like a little, but you want more because the stimulus within your brain, whether we call the chemicals or whatever, you want more. It begins to literally reprogram your brain the way that you think. And so what do you have to do? You have to have more of it. It has to be stronger emphasis of it because it's not enough. Same thing for alcohol, same thing for any other type of drug. You have to have more of a stimulus to get the same original effect or greater. Exact same thing with sex. Exact same thing where it will not be enough and leads to greater and greater and greater promiscuity. Sex outside of marriage was never intended to be and not because God is a killjoy, but because God wants you to have the greatest joy possible. I got to say it again for some of you. Not because God is a killjoy, but because he wants you to have the greatest joy possible possible did he say keep it in the covenant of marriage that's where it belongs you've heard people use arguments before right they know they're in sin but they'll use this kind of argument well listen you don't go buy a car without test driving it do you right you've heard that before some of y'all have been ignorant enough and and we have been ignorant enough to use such an argument it's like you don't buy a car without test driving it well she or he is not a car my friend okay does that that help a little bit right there that's kind of a good way to start sex is not y'all ready for this not the greatest blessing in marriage it's a wonderful gift it's a it's a beautiful thing it's it's great But if your marriage is only built on your sex life, I'll go ahead and say this to you, there's only so many positions you can contort your body to before you realize that it can't just be about that. And if your only goal is self-satisfaction within sex, your sex life will be horrible. In your marriage, if you are not a servant lover, if if your greatest goal, men and women, if your goal is not to satisfy your spouse in the process of sex, your sex won't be good and most likely you won't have very much of it. Because the whole point goes back to Ephesians 5.21. Do what? Submit one to another in reverence to God. Serve one another. Why do we serve one another? So that we can build them up. Why do we do that? You want your sex life to be awesome? Seek to build up the other person. Guys, start the process when? Five minutes before? No. Crockpot syndrome? No. No, guys. No. You're a microwave, she's a crock pot. Her roast is amazing, but it takes a while, okay? You know what I'm saying? Here's the deal. It starts in the morning. I don't know what she gets into. I don't know what she likes. I don't know if it's a cup of coffee. I don't know if it's a note. I don't know what it is. But don't be stupid. It starts in the morning. It starts throughout the day. It goes along with what I said a few weeks ago. Put reminders in your phone about shooting a text, making a phone call, having flowers delivered if you know where she's at, or you getting your own flowers, or picking flowers from another person's yard and apologizing later. I don't care what it is. 
But do you see what I'm getting at? Like, the whole point is, you want to serve your spouse. I want to serve Erica. I want to see her, as if you would compare her to a flower, I want to water her garden and to make sure she blooms. I want life to be great in that area. I don't want to fight with her. I don't want to have conflict with her that is unnecessary. I want to watch our marriage grow, right? We all want to have a good marriage. But sadly, many don't. Sadly, many are hurting in the process of being married. And some people say, well, we're getting married, so why don't we just have sex? I mean, we know that we love each other. We know that we're getting married. Can you not wait? Can, can you, you're, you're like my son. You know, my son's over here. Again, he's a boy, biologically a male, but he's not a man. And if I tell him, hey, buddy, I will give you one piece of candy today, or if you can wait a week, I will take you up to Bozier and we'll buy all the candy you want in a store. And he'll answer to me, he'll be like, I want the candy today, Dad. Okay, do you see what I'm saying? There is no delayed gratification. Here, you want, you want to watch something screw you up? You ready for, this will screw your world up. By making something beautiful, common, on the night of your marriage, beyond the celebration that you'll have with your other people, how many ever that is, the bedroom will be common. It's true. Because it's not, it's not, and that's why like, if I counsel someone, a couple I'm counseling right now, they have had sex before marriage, and so literally my, my advice to them, according to scripture, stop having sex. Stop having sex so that in a couple of months that when y'all do get married, this can be a wonderful and special night and do not think that God's going to be like, oh, it's not really a big deal, you know. They're just kids, you know. No. No. Again, I, I wish I had that in my world. I wish I had somebody just straight up come to my face and be like, hey, stop being an idiot. You're being an idiot. You're just a chump. Just stop being an idiot. Save it. Wait if you want it to be beautiful. Save it. Wait if you want it to be beautiful. God, God's ways are the way, are the best. Listen, and some people will throw this number at you. I can't imagine having sex with just one person for the rest of my life. You want to tell you something cool? She and you are ever changing because you're finite. That means that you will be having sex with basically a different person as the seasons change in her life, as she grows, as she blossoms. And here's the cool part. There are seasons that are really, really wonderful, and there's other seasons that are more difficult, and the difficult seasons make you appreciate the wonderful ones still ahead, okay? So here's the wonderful part. Sin is a mirage. No different than a thirsty man in the desert who sees what he appears to be, this lush water, and says, I want that, and I'll do anything to get it, but yet finds himself coming up short, and it's nothing but dry sand. God's way is the reality. God's way is the best. And here's the deal. You can do it your way, but be prepared for the repercussions that come along with your way. It hurts. It hurts. So number one, taking points. Sex unites us to our spouse. Sex unites us to our spouse. Genesis 2, 24 and 25 says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. Sex unites us to our spouse, creates an intimacy and a transparency unlike anything else else. In the Song of Solomon, when you read that, it literally has her describing his body, and there is absolutely no shame going on. Here's a cool one. Y'all ready for it? Here's a, here's a beautiful lesson for my younger people. This is for my younger ones. For those of you who will wait, for those of you who will protect your body, per, just put boundaries around you, allow yourself to be surrounded by other godly single people who don't, who love God more than they love sex and instant gratification, if you will wait, if you will protect yourself you will literally be able to never have in the back of your mind any form, any way of comparison. Because you and your spouse are the ones working it out together. You and your spouse are the ones working that out together, fumbling, making your way through, growing all along in that whole process together. Now here's the deal. Some of the stuff that I'm talking about is heavy because a lot of us haven't been there. We've made previous mistakes, sinned, there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus, okay, for those who repent of their sins. I, I don't want to sell you fairy dust and just say, well, hey, the, just the past, the past, just leave it. No, I want, I want to say this, repent of your sins and in faith trust in Jesus Christ. Let the gospel purify your mind and purify your heart and purify, let the blood of Jesus purify your conscience. And yeah, you're going to have to work through some stuff. 
Just because you are no longer uh, under sin doesn't mean that you don't still have scars. Y'all with me? Just because you're not under sin doesn't mean you don't still have scars. And some of the scars may be memories, may not be physical, but nonetheless scars. Work it out with your spouse, okay? For those of y'all who are single, man, God's intention for you is great. Do it his way, though. Lewis Mead said it well. The physical side of sexual intercourse is a sign of what ought to happen on the inside. It is the final physical intimacy. Two bodies are never closer than when you're having sex. So what is that another way of saying? When you believe in Christ Jesus, when you commit your life to him, repent and have faith, what do we do? We baptize you, correct? You are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit so that everyone in the public will know outward proclamation of an inward decision. When I got married in America, what do we do? We put a ring on our finger so that everyone would know that Erica is my wife and I am her husband. An outward declaration of an inward decision that I will never leave, I will never forsake until death do us part. Here's the same thing and this is exactly what sex does in a sense for us is literally outward expression of an inward love for one another. This is another way of saying I love you. It's another way of saying, I want to give all to you, and I don't want anything to be in between me and you. I want all of you. In Genesis 4.1, I know the context is different, but nonetheless, look at this. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. So he had sexual relations with his wife. But here's the deal. The same word for know in the Hebrew is the same word God uses to describe his knowledge of us. It's not just a factual knowledge of us, like I know the stats about you. I looked at your Facebook page and stalked you for a minute. No, it's not that. It's literally this. It's to know someone personally and deep and experientially knowing the other human being in a full way. You see what sex does? Mingles body, soul together. And such a powerful, powerful weapon that God has put into the marriage arsenal. Number two is sex solidifies the one flesh union. Point two. It solidifies the one flesh union. As we read early in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 3-5, through 5, it also protects us against temptation from committing adultery. How many of y'all know in a world in which we live in, we need protection? We need protection in our marriage. We need protection that we are getting our fill from our spouse and not from anyone else. We need to get our fill from our spouse and not from anyone else. I tell Erica all the time, did you notice what it said in verse, I think it's verse uh, 3. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights. I threw that word at Erica a while back. I said, Erica, I have conjugal rights in this marriage. And she just looked at me, what did you say? You know, what did you say to me? And I was like, I got conjugal rights. And she said, you better explain this word to me. In the marriage, it literally says that... My body's not for my own self-satisfaction. My body's hers and her body is mine and that we're going to serve one another in capacity to meet each other's needs in the process of it. And literally he says, do not deprive. Don't deprive one another. So, okay, reverse it. One's the negative. Don't deprive. Here's another way of saying Here's what God's saying. Have sex often. Not forcing it upon either, but have sex often. Because here's another part about sex that maybe you haven't thought of. Sex is a great indicator of your own life together. And you say, what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you this. If if mama's not happy, it says that the house is not happy. Well, I'll tell you, if, if neither one of you are happy or one of you is angry, they ain't wanting to have sex with you. Okay, so if you are frequently in the place where you're having a minimum amount of sex within your marriage, then you need to go figure out what is wrong in our marriage. Like, what's the problem? Why is he making me angry? Or what is she doing that's causing me to be distanced from him? What is happening? It is a gauge, if you will, of your marriage when you begin to look at why don't we ever have sex together? Why are we never intimate together? Erica's tall, tall. <laughs> he told me advice on our wedding day. He said, look, son, he was a, he was a goofball. <laughs> he said, look, you need to get you a big old jar of, uh, of M&Ms. And you fill that jar up with M&Ms. And every time that, you know, you, you and Erica make love together, you pull out an M&M and that should last you to the rest of your days. <laughs> and I was like, I sure hope I can do better than that, sir. You know, <laughs> anyway, but it, basically almost a joke. Like if you're, if, if there's never any intimacy, then there's something wrong. There's something wrong. He says, protect 
your spouse. He says, do not deprive. And you know what the word for do not deprive in Greek is? Literally means do not rob. Don't take something that should be given. And here's the deal. If you're always waiting to your spouse till both of y'all and the stars have aligned and, and both of y'all have tons of energy, shoot, you better never have kids, one. Let's, let's not have kids. Uh, yeah, amen to that, right? Uh, you know, you better never have kids and, and you need one of those jobs like on, um, on the Home and Garden Network or whatever where they go have a $1.7 million budget and they make uh, thumbtacks uh, as a business. You know, like you work three hours a day and they have $1.7 million to spend. That doesn't exist, okay? What I'm saying is if it's always when I'm ready or when she's ready, listen, you better start scheduling some stuff in there. When I was younger and I had an older person who was married tell me something like that, I blew him off like, you're an idiot. What are you talking about? I mean, that we, you no energy. What, what, what is that? Shoot. Get a little bit older and throw a couple of kids in the mix and see what your world looks like working a, a 8 to 10 or 12 hour a day. Here's the thing. You've got to make time for one another. And some of you are like, well, I don't want to be fake. I'm not going to be fake. Well, here's the deal. You better learn how to give a gift. I'm going to sit for a second. We got to learn how to. We got to learn how to be servant lovers. We, we've got to learn how to to give a gift to one another. Again, we're looking at our marriages, and you got to realize something greater is happening than just a physical action. Even if you think it's just a physical action, there's more happening there than you know. And here's the other side: do not deprive intentionally one another. Don't deprive intentionally one another. And lastly, closing is this: sex expresses love while producing pleasure. Sex is primarily for basically four different things. It's, it's for procreation, obviously, right? Keep filling the earth with offspring, but it's also for love, and it's also for pleasure, and it's also for consummating the marriage. There's four different reasons basically for sex. So it's meant for love, but it also produces pleasure. Andreas Kostenberger said this sexual stimulation and the sexual climax and sexual fulfillment are God's gracious gift for humanity to be gratefully enjoyed without shame, guilt, or fear. Within the marriage bond, sex becomes the ultimate physical expression of deep, committed, and devoted love. I'll give you a verse right here, Proverbs 5, verse 15 through 19. It says, drink water, and understand that he's not talking literally, he's talking metaphorically. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets... Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a gracious doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. You notice what he said, intoxicated? I mean, literally, you need to be staggering back there just being like, Whoa, man. You know what I'm talking about? Like, guys, y'all need to be excited about seeing your wife. For some of you, you need to have new images programmed into your mind. And wives, some of y'all, take this the right way. Don't take it the wrong way. Need to allow your husbands to see a little more of you a little more often, if you know what I'm saying. Like, allow yourself to be engaged in... I know some people take it the wrong way, and I'm super thankful my wife doesn't take it the wrong way. She's very gracious to my craziness. Um, but literally, take it as a joy when your husband is pursuing you and is wanting to engage you. I understand that maybe he wants to engage you more than you want to engage him. I know sometimes that's different, but in most cases they do. Take that as like, he loves me, he wants me. Would you rather him engaging and chasing someone else? No. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't want that. Be intoxicated by her love. Be filled. And what's filled mean? That means you don't have any room left. Be filled with her body, with her love, with her intimacy. So sex, I want to say this, should be exhilarating. It should be amazing. It should bring about deep in love. Mark in your Bible, or you don't, just mark it down in your notes. Song of Solomon, I'm not going to go there right now, but chapter 8, verse 6 and 7 literally talk, talks about the love and the depth of love that is created in the bond of marriage. But not only is it love, but it's also erotic and it's also pleasurable. Listen to what he says in Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 6. He says, How beautiful and pleasant you are, O loved one, with all your delights. 
Your stature is like a palm tree and your breasts are like its clusters. I say I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its fruit. Oh, may your breasts be like clusters of the vine and the scent of your breath like apples and your mouth like the best wine. Do you see what it's getting at for us? It should be amazing. It should be exciting. It should be playful. You know? We need to redeem what Satan has tried to destroy. You should use this wonderful gift that God has given you when used in the right context, in the covenant of marriage. It can bond you and bind you together in such a great way that you will forever be changed. And yeah, you're going to have seasons. And yeah, there's going to be times when it's not nearly what you want it to be or what you thought it would be. And there's going to be other times when you go through sickness and when you go through some of the pain. But listen, that covenant binds you together. The agreement that you made for one another binds you together because if your sex life is the only thing that has bound you together, you will not last. You just won't. It will never last because it was never meant to carry that type of weight. So what are we looking at here? has the power to bind us, to create love, to create an environment of continually, if you will, it's oil for the motor. Without it, it stops, correct? Same deal in your own life. It smooths some things out that otherwise would not be expressed. But it also brings pleasure and it points to, I don't know if you've read your Bible lately, but Jesus said that there's no marrying in heaven. So another way of saying there's no sex in heaven. And some of you are like, well, I don't know about this heaven deal after all. But no, think about this for a second. At the very moment of sex and climax within sex is only short and temporal. It is an indicator and a pointer to the greater pleasure of God that you will experience continually and forever in the presence of Christ Jesus. It is a pointer. Even the best marriages are only a pointer to the marriage to come. Only a shadow, only a glimpse, only a foretaste. And so what I want to say to you, as great and as grand and as wonderful as it is, it is pointing you to Jesus. That you would rejoice in the gift that he is giving you, but even greater that you would look forward with future hope and future grace and say, I cannot wait. If you're saying that heaven is going to be so much better that there would even be no need for, no reason for, that the pleasure in heaven is so much greater than... And I can't wait. I can't, I can't wait. And this is one of my favorite, probably one of my favorite verses in Psalms. Psalm 1611. Look on your screen real quick. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. It's just a pointer. It's a precious one. It's a beautiful one. It's a great one. But man, the whole point is to point you to Jesus. If you do it God's way, you'll never have a day. You'll never have a day that you'll be like, I just wish I wouldn't have done that. I just wish I wouldn't have followed his way. I just any and I'm I'm talking about any area of life. You will never find an area. Even if your brain says one thing and your heart maybe says one thing, but when you say this, your word is a light unto my feet, a lamp unto my path. Like, I will trust you as the infinite and wise creator God to dictate my life. I will say your kingdom come and your will be done, not mine. I will say seek first your kingdom and not mine. I've, I've never met and I never will a person who truly lives out his Christian or her Christian faith say that God left me or forsake me or his way wasn't better. You'll never find it. And so I don't want this to be a, a message of shame for some of you out here. I don't want that. It's not what it's meant to be. It's meant to be a message of hope in particular for those of you who have yet to get married. No matter what your past holds, listen, your future can be so much brighter. Make the decisions today. And for those of you who are married, Don't ever neglect the marriage bed to keep it pure, to keep it holy. Live to be a servant to your spouse and to raise them up to be either the man or the woman of God that he's created them to be.
Let's stand together as we get ready to take communion.